everyone, welcome to Wednesday Wisdom. This week's episode is very special because we have Dr. Gary Ferguson as a guest. And for those of you who don't know, he is basically the person who invented the way we think of UVB today. So we're gonna pick his brain and figure out how he figured out the way we think about UVB. <laughs> so Dr. Ferguson, can you tell us when you first realized there was an issue? Uh, basically, I've been working with reptiles my whole life, and I've always wanted to work with chameleons. And I finally got a chance in uh, the 1980s and the 1990s to work with Jacksons and Panther chameleons. And so the importers were bringing them in, I was buying them, and I was setting them up, and they did really well, both the Jacksons and the Panther chameleons. But we had a problem because we would get wild caughts and they would uh, breed. Uh, if they were gravid, they would lay their eggs and they would hatch out very nicely. Uh, or we could actually breed the male of the female and they would uh, produce good eggs. But they'd go all the way to term and uh, they would hatch. But as, you, uh, as they laid clutch after clutch after clutch, the eggs would start failing to hatch and we didn't have any idea what was going on. Uh, but we kind of put our heads together and uh, decided that the problem had to do something with soft bones. And uh, the, the, the term embryos or, or juveniles were looked like great little baby chameleons, but they basically had jelly for bones, no calcium. And so we thought it was a calcium issue. And there's two ways that you can deal with uh, incorporating calcium into your body's physiology. And that's with people. Uh, with people mm -hmm. and, and mammals uh, that had been known up to the time anyway that we started this work. And that is through the diet. You could uh, take in vitamin D uh, or you could expose yourself to ultraviolet light. And the result of that would be the, the production of vitamin D. And what vitamin D does is it helps you take calcium up uh, in your, from your diet and provide a reservoir for calcium to make bones and nerve functioning and the whole bit. So some, for some reason they weren't uptaking calcium because we were feeding them calcium uh, and rich diets and they looked healthy and everything and the, the adult animals uh, maintained themselves well but somehow they weren't getting any calcium into their eggs. So basically uh, the fact that we had all of these uh, eggs dying uh, either after they'd been in captivity a while or if they were raised uh, uh, in captivity that we had to deal with and figure out somehow. So the two things we wanted to start working with were uh, ultraviolet light produced vitamin D and dietary vitamin D that they eat that you would give them as a supplement. So I know you did an experiment with panther chameleons mm -hmm. on that where you tested dietary vitamin D3 versus mm. UV exposure. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, that's, uh, this was uh, our first attempt and, and the panther chameleons are so great for, for experiments because they will tolerate a lot of minim minimalist light setups. In other words, they need certain requirements and we can get to that later. But uh, basically we could set up nice experiments with them and replicate our experiments and what we did was to set up an experiment where we put a bunch of isolated juveniles and exposed them to high vitamin D but low UV and another group that we exposed them to high uh, UV but low vitamin D uh, and then we uh, basically combined the effects of low and high UV with the effects of low vitamin D intake in the diet and high vitamin D intake in the diet. And the results of that experiment, which took a year and a half to get because we had to raise them all the way up to breed, uh, was that the uh, animals that got high, high UV, uh, whether they got low or high vitamin D in their diet, were the ones that successfully produced hatchlings. And so it turns out that the UV produced vitamin D was the most critical one. For these panther chameleons. For, panther, for these panther chameleons. And so you realized that they needed UV, mm -hmm. but then you've done more follow-up experiments about 
the level of UV that mm -hmm. these panther chameleons and other reptiles yeah. gain. But before I get to that, let me explain uh, something we discovered in that, doing that oh, first yes. experiment. And that was that uh, we were having a little bit of problems with our UV treatment because we were using sun lamps. That was about all that was available to us and they're really strong. And we were getting some tendencies after about the first week of the exposing them to a UV one hour a day that looked like they were burning their skins. So he says, well, let's give them a gradient. Let's, let's put up a board or something when we turn on these UVs and, and if they start getting injured, maybe they'll move out into, into the, uh, the, the shade part of the gradient. And uh, so the very first day where we set up this board right before we turned on the UV lights, I was down in my lab giving a lecture and my graduate student, John Jones, was down there taking the data and he came running down to the end of the hall and he said, Gary, you got to see this. And so I wrapped up my class and I went back and every single lizard that we've been feeding high vitamin D was in the shade. And every single lizard that we've been feeding low vitamin D was out there basking. <clears throat> and so we took about th six years after that, John got his master's in we published that result and he went off. But with two other graduate students, I was able to repeat that experiment uh, twice. And once uh, uh, with a group of panther chameleons from a different part of the range of the panther chameleon. And then once by setting them up in outdoor enclosures. And uh, the same thing happened. So basically when you ask the question, how much UV do I need to give this animal? Uh, just ask your chameleon. Seems like they can regulate themselves. <laughs> they can regulate themselves. And so the, the, the upshot of that is that what you need to do when you keep them in captivity is give them a gradient and let them make the decision. If you give them a vitamin D supplement, they'll probably expose themselves to less UV. And if you don't, they'll expose themselves to more. And most of the experiments I've done uh, since then, uh, I've tried to totally eliminate the dietary vitamin D from the experiment. And they've done pretty good. Now, as I mentioned, uh, with dietary vitamin D, they do enhance their uh, egg hatchability a little bit better, but not, you don't want to eliminate the UV and you want to give it to them in a gradient so they can move back and forth. And so when you did eliminate the vitamin D3 from the diet, did you still notice them um, using the whole gradient. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. So they can still sense in their selves their deficiency or their excess right. and they can regulate. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. And so um, in that same vein, you've also done experiments about the intensity of UV right. that these animals get. So how did you figure out? Yeah, one of the things that, that based on all of the herpetology knowledge I had and experience with friends doing other th things is that not every species of lizard is exposed to the same UV environment. Uh, uh, there have been a lot of studies on anoles, the, the little green anoles and the tropical anoles that uh, show that some are, are high in the canopy, some are low in the canopy, some are on the ground, and they divide up these niches, spatial niches, very, very precisely. And uh, basically what that means is that they're not getting the same amount of UV intensity. And so uh, we decided to just go out and we couldn't really get a handle on this unless we went out and we really started looking at what the UV exposure was. So we went ahead and, and, and did a study where we looked at 15 species of lizards and snakes and followed them around. And uh, every time we didn't see one, we'd take a, a reading of the, their UV exposure. and. By doing this, we, we found that we could set up four different zones of ultraviolet light that various lizards are adapted to. And there's zone one, two, three, and four. The zone one are the species that rarely expose themselves to full sun and come out in the morning and the afternoon. And the zone four are the ones that live in places like deserts or tropical environments and spend all day out in the sun. And so, we said, well, it might make a difference what kind of a gradient you give them in the lab. 
uh, depending on what their natural zone is. And so uh, to make a long story short, the intensity of the top of the gradient, if you give them a gra gradient in a cage or an enclosure, uh, should match as closely as it can to what their natural uh, uh, intensity is in the field. Uh, and especially for the ones that uh, are zone four, that have a lot of uh, exposure naturally, you want to make sure that you give them a fairly strong UV source uh, at the top of that gradient, but give them lots of choices to get out of it. And you've done other experiments where you've kind of compared about um, animals getting a lot of low UV exposure yeah. versus a small amount of high UV exposure for right. those different zones. Yeah, and so, so we decided we better look at this. And so we tested what's called the reciprocity law. And this is a law put up in studying the effects of UV for sunburn in humans uh, by a guy named Parrish. And basically what this law states is that UV dose, the actual amount of UV that you uh, get exposed to is a product of the intensity multiplied by the time of exposure. So for example, if you get a high dose or a high intensity, but for a short time, you'll get a certain UV dose. And, but you can get that same dose if you give a weaker intensity for a longer time. And so we said, well, it shouldn't matter then what your uh, top reading is for the gradient, uh, as long as you give them enough time to bask in uh, the UV that's available. And that was your hypothesis, That right? was our hypothesis. And so basically uh, we tested that hypothesis using reptosun bulbs and uh, put them at different heights and we exposed animals throughout their period from hatching all the way to maturity and reproduction and measured hatching success of their eggs. And uh, it turned out that in terms of the hatchlings being healthy, growing, growing up and uh, reproducing and producing fertile eggs, it didn't matter. The dose was what was important. But if you uh, didn't give them their natural dose, their natural irradiance, their natural exposure intensity, uh, you better darn sure give them enough time. And if you don't give them enough time, uh, the quality of the eggs is uh, not very good. And your hatching, our hatching success, success went down when we gave them a very low intensity uh, for a long time, but not long enough. So the dose that they actually get is not not constant. If they deviate from their preferred uh, zone, uh, they need a longer and longer time uh, to uh, make good eggs. Now, whether or not they will respond to a really low dose, really we haven't tested because when we tested this, we forced them to get a certain amount of uh, intensity for a certain amount of time or a particular dose that we picked. And did you ever expose an animal to a higher UV exposure than you thought that they needed and see what that Not was? yet. Not yet, okay. Not yet, that's left to do. Plus the, you need, really need to repeat that experiment, giving them a really gradient for mm -hmm. each animal to see what they do. But their behavior is key when you give them that gradient. That's yeah. one of the essential parts. Yeah. So, so the recommendations that are in the literature now and the care sheets and everything is to try to match the, the uh, gradient to their natural UV zone. And what is a UV zone? Well, we know it for a few species, but there's 4,000 species we need to test. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah there's a lot to yeah. still get, right. get done. Uh, and so without going into a full care video for Panther Commands, that's mm -hmm. obviously something that you're passionate about. If mm -hmm. you had to give a new chameleon owner a recommendation for say like um, UV mm -hmm. exposure for their chameleon mm -hmm. and like how to give them that proper gradient, what would you? Okay, uh, basically uh, one of the things that I'm pretty sure of is that they will 
uh, seek out UV independently from heat sources. So in, in my cages, I set up basically a UV zone for basking and a heat zone for basking. And I've actually, for just a couple of individuals living in my, in my cages at home, uh, shown that they will spend like 40% of their time basking under the UV for females and then 20% of the time basking under the heat for, uh, for just to get their temperature up. And uh, uh, males are different, it's kind of the opposite. So uh, just set up a, a gradient with a, probably a UV zone and a heat zone located on different sides of the, of the top. And I, I've even put in a few extra zones towards the lower part of the cage and they tend to ignore those, they just stay up at the top, but then they spend a lot of time away from the lights. So they kind of get, regulate their exposure to heat and temperature as they need it. What zone heat would you heat. say is best for panther chameleons? Uh, probably they're a zone four animal. We've actually gotten a little bit of data uh, that uh, they're, uh, even though they're not desert basking lizards that you think would obviously be a four, they do expose themselves to pretty high UV and so, but it's still important to give them that yeah. gradient, but they yeah. do like right. high UV. Yeah. And uh, since you, why do you like panther chameleons oh, so man. much? <laughs> well, they're beautiful and they're extroverts. I mean, they, they do stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there's really one really neat thing that, that happened to me that I wasn't expecting. Uh, someone sent me a UV meter with a long extension on it. It's just kind of a model to test out to see if it would work. And, and so I went up to my female chameleon that, uh, you know, knows me and you know, every time I come by, she looks and wants the cricket and that kind of thing. And so I stuck this sensor in and uh, her immediate reaction was, snake! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they're just really engaging creatures and they're, they're very forgiving. If you don't follow to the letter every little light and heat and nutrition uh, the thing that's on your your care guide sheet, uh, they're they're very forgiving. They're good, adaptable creatures, mm -hmm. easy to work with. And I forgot to ask when you mentioned you said that males and females will behave differently for UV exposure. Do you know why? Well. Uh, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the bottom line is that's just a very early preliminary observation. Okay. I really haven't done any experiments on that yet. That's so interesting. I also wanted to know, uh, panther chameleons are known for all of their different colors. Mm -hmm. And something that people who don't keep them might not know is that they get lighter and more colorful when they sleep. Mm -hmm. But that seems evolutionarily backwards. Well, like, what they really do is they just shut down all of their their, their skin color changing mechanisms mm -hmm. and they just get white. So right. if you if you shine a light on them, boy, there they are. They're easy to see. Well, natural predators don't have flashlights. <laughs> so they wouldn't be able to see. And so so you know basically, uh, the main defense mechanism that a chameleon has at night when it's sound asleep is if the branch starts shaking, they drop. And, and they just fall down. And they fall down. And when I was in Kenya looking at Jackson's chameleons. I couldn't find them. When they dropped, they yeah. just, whoa. Well, they're there, but I can't see them. And they're they in the survive leaves. the drop too, yeah. usually, whoa. Yeah. And so their resting phase is actually bright and more colorful. Yeah, it's not necessarily more colorful, oh. but yeah, it but depends on. lighter. Light, light green is pretty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. If you had to share um, one tip for a new chameleon owner, mm -hmm. you mentioned the UV exposure, but mm -hmm. something else since you like these so much. Well, let me, let me go through what I think, uh, what I tell people when they want to keep a chameleon and okay. they don't know, know them for a dog. <clears throat> yeah. Educate yourself. Go to, the, go to the websites and get what's written about the species you think you want to keep mm -hmm. and uh, the type of enclosures and everything you need before you get your chameleon. So do that, uh, get all of your cage set up and ready before you uh, uh, even think about buying your animal. And so it's easier to do this online where you don't see a cute chameleon you have to have. <laughs> <laughs> and then once you get that done, one other thing that I always forget to do and 
I regret it occasionally. Get in touch with a reptile veterinarian because if you start having problems, uh, you can't just go to any veterinarian for help. And so get all set up and then go ahead and get your chameleon and do your homework on that. Make sure you don't just go to a pet store and buy one, but you really you know. find out who is, has the reputation of producing good animals and then get your animal and then follow the guidelines as much as you can, but watch your animal. That's the main thing. If the animal looks uh, uh, desperate, uh, can get some consultation or something like that. So just be, not, don't get in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then we're starting to run out of time, but if you had to share one more thing about your research about or about mm. your passion for panther chameleons, like what would it be? Uh, I don't know. I was thinking about uh, just some of the things that, uh, oh, I guess I'll make this point. Uh, our knowledge about how to keep chameleons or any reptile is based on our knowledge of them in their natural environment. And so basically, uh, Lots more studies need to be done and maybe should be funded by places like ZooMed <laughs> to get out in the field and study the most popular reptile species, just not with any preconceived thing, except just to watch them and see where they are and see how they behave through a daily cycle or something like that. A couple of things that, that happened to me when I first went into the field to study Jackson's chameleons and then went into the field to study panther chameleons. Uh, we were staying in, in Nairobi, Kenya, doing a study on Jackson's, chamele Jackson's chameleons. And there was a laundry room in this little motel with a stick coming out of a planter. And uh, there was a Jackson's chameleon asleep with a little light bulb at night. No plants, no anything else around, but this little stick coming out of this, uh, pla this planter that had a dead plant in it. And that, Night after night, it was there, and we were gone in the day, so I didn't have a chance to observe it. But what the thing was doing, it was sitting there next to that light, and bugs would come around at night and be sound asleep, and then it would wake up the next morning and, and feed. On all the bugs that were so it was to basically light. in an open air enclosure. <laughs> oh my God! And of course, there were Jackson's chameleons in the yard, plants and everything too there. But and then the other thing is. We always think of like the wonderful cages that ZooMed are designing and all that, that here is the pristine world without humans. <laughs> and panther chameleons, one of the reasons they're so adaptable to captivity is they're adapted to trashy environments throughout Madagascar in the range where they occur. Uh, the roadside uh, places where they've cut down all the plants and weeds and stuff have grown back, perfect habitat for, and probably the dominant place where you find panther chameleons. Nice pristine woods and wood edges with ferns and vines and all that. Not necessarily. Uh, <laughs> That's so cool. And we, we found one Auslitz chameleon in downtown Diego Suarez, Madagascar, uh, in a little circle with a roundabout and a few little trees there that were dead. It was the end of the rainy, the dry season, and a big Auslitz chameleon just sitting on a wrought iron fence. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Cars and carts and people and bicycles. So they're very adaptable. And they ignore them because they're like squirrels to them. Wow. <laughs> well, I wish we could talk more because mm -hmm. I there are so many interesting things, but we're running out of footage, so mm -hmm. um, thank you everyone for watching this. And if you have any questions for Dr. Ferguson, this isn't live, but please ask them in the comments. and. Um, we will get you answers because um, it's just so impressive, like how much you know and how much you've. Um, I'm forgetting it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thanks, Zoomed, for being being here. <laughs>